Evening, church. Evening. Open up your Bibles uh, tonight to Psalm 23, a familiar psalm. Probably most of your Bibles uh, may open up there uh, automatically. You probably uh, have read this psalm many, many times, and I've uh, preached on it two other times uh, since I've been here. Uh, but I just felt led to, to go back through it one more time and just uh, tell you about my shepherd. Based off of the, the opening text there, the, the Lord is my shepherd. But if you placed your faith in Jesus, guess what? The Lord is your shepherd also. Um, in the Gospels, one of Jesus' favorite uh, analogies that he used for himself and his disciples was that of a shepherd and his flock. Uh, you turn to John chapter 10, and that's what it's really all about. It's about that's all these good shepherd passages. And his point was not to... Uh, demean uh, his followers by, by any means uh, or, or, or to, to disparage them. Uh, his point was to help them understand their complete and utter dependence upon him as their shepherd. And the same thing for us, right? That we are uh, completely dependent upon him uh, for all things. He, he wanted them to, uh, to remind them that the, the shepherd is only responsible for his own sheep. Right, that that that's the only ones he's responsible for. It's a unique uh, relationship, and uh, as a pastor uh, of a local church, you, I'm only responsible for the the, the sheep of this flock, uh, the members of this church. That's the only ones that I'm uh, responsible for. I'm not responsible for the members of Freedom or First Baptist or Shady Grove or any other church that's in this area. They have their own shepherds uh, that are responsible and that will. Uh, a give and account for them. And so every church, every biblical church in a way, has a shepherd that, that God has called to, to lead there, or at least hopefully they're in the process of finding one if they are without one. And so I am a shepherd, uh, and I'm trying very hard to be a good shepherd. And though I fail quite often. But I'm not the good shepherd. Right? I'm not. I'm not the good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. He is the one that leads us and guides us. In fact, uh, every shepherd, myself included, is nothing but an under-shepherd. That, that we serve under his leadership. The, that, that we lead as he leads us. The only authority that, that I have, that, that we have as his under-shepherds, is the authority that he gives us to lead his church, to lead his people. I believe that Jesus also wanted his disciples to know that uh, the, that. The sheep will only listen to their shepherd, mm -hmm. their own shepherd. The relationship between a shepherd and a sheep is so close that they will not follow the instructions of another shepherd. Uh, we see this in, in John 10, 27. It says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Right? That's the same way with us, that, that we know the voice of Jesus. Hopefully, whenever we hear people begin to try to uh, to have to say things to us or try to share uh, what they would say or spiritual things to us and give us advice and, and share wisdom and we can tell whether or not it comes from the Lord or not, whether it lines up with God's word. We know our shepherd's voice. The shepherd and his flock developed such a close bond that they spent practically every minute of every day together. The shepherds lived out in the open prairies with their sheep and so they spent a whole a lot of time together, getting to know one another in, in very uh, 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 personal ways, I guess you could say. They knew they could tell the difference between, the, not just the way they looked, but the way they ha acted, the way they behaved, which ones were more ornery than others, which ones were more stubborn than others, which ones needed more care than others. The shepherd knows his sheep. The shepherd had three primary responsibilities regarding his sheep. It's the shepherd's job to provide for the needs of his sheep, right? To lead them, to feed them, and to water them, right, Ronnie? Right? Mm -hmm. you, you still have your sheep? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you know all about this, right? Mm -hmm. You're, you're our, our, our resident uh, sheep expert. If we have any questions about this, if you need anybody to validate what I'm saying, we can come to you and you can uh, clear things up for us, for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, the shepherd's job was also to protect his sheep from predators, from uh, from, from, and from them harming themselves because they can do that too, right? They can do that pretty well. Uh, they, they, sometimes they need discipline. Sometimes they need correction. Sometimes you have to 
bind their wounds when they injured themselves. It was a shepherd's uh, 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 it was a shepherd's continual presence that ensured the good quality of life for those sheep that were under his care. And so when we think about those sea things, when we think about uh, 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 the, the providing for protection and presence, does that does that kind of sound familiar to us as we read through our Bibles and we think about what God has done for us through Christ? The very same things that we have, he provides, he protects, and we have his presence. And so I think that's what I want us to see. That's what I want us to think about tonight as we look at Psalm 23, as I, as I testify of the goodness and faithfulness of my shepherd and your shepherd tonight from Psalm 23. And so let's grab our Bibles and let's stand as we honor uh, the reading of God's Word. Psalm 23, all, all six verses. David begins, Though the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still water. He restore, restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is God's word. Well, Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given us. We thank you for the time that we've already had uh, in your word, the, the, the Sunday school hour, the, the morning service, and as we uh, have, have sung praises to your name. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to worship. And tonight, as we continue to, to worship you through the proclamation of your word, and Father, that you, you would encourage us, that you would uh, comfort us tonight with uh, this passage, that we are reminded uh, that we do have a shepherd. Not just a shepherd, but the shepherd, the good shepherd of your word. We thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you that, that he provides for our every need. We thank you that... He, he protects us, and we're so, so thankful that we have his continual presence in our lives. So, Father, again, we just ask that you would encourage us through your word tonight. We love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As I've already said, and as many of you already know, this is a Psalm of David, and uh when we think about David, we know so much about him, and one of the uh, the titles that we, we are familiar with, uh, because God's Word tells us, is we know him as a man after God's own heart. And so as we, we, we look through the scriptures and we see the, the, the accounts that we have of him, uh, we tend to think of all the beautiful and encouraging psalms that he wrote, right? like this one, right? so many of them. Uh, we remember him uh, facing off with Goliath, right, his 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 triumphs there. We remember how he was so loyal to King Saul, even after uh, Saul was, you know, began to hate him and was jealous of him, and he, and he, and he uh, still remained faithful to him. We're, we're familiar with all the great victories that, that David uh, uh, led against the enemies of Israel, and we think about all these wonderful things, but sometimes we forget there's another side of David. That's right. All right, there's another side of David, just like there's another side of us, that sometimes we... We, we, like to, we like to brag about the good things, but then we like to kind of not talk so much about the failures. And, and David had his share of those as well. The, we see in the scriptures that David uh, was able to grow prideful at times and, and become complacent. Right? We can identify with that. Uh, we see that David could, uh, uh, could not manage his own family well. If you want a parenting handbook, Right on how or on how not to raise children and how not to parent. Maybe David might be able to write a good book uh, on that. He had trouble there. Uh, we also see that David committed adultery with Bathsheba and had uh, Uriah the Hittite, you know, murdered. Basically, set him up to die to kind of cover up their sin. And and many of the psalms that we read, uh, though many of them are beautiful, some of them are kind of gritty. Right, they're, they're they're gritty and they revealed a man that wrestled with fear and doubt and. And even bitterness. Uh, I believe that the title for some are in, in precatory psalms, where he's asking God to break people up. <laughs> right? He's not. He's not in, in talking about being gracious or merciful. He's talking about 
you know, smite my enemies, destroy them, right? Remove them uh, from, from before me. Uh, but thankfully, as I've already said, David wrote many encouraging psalms revealing God's goodness and faithfulness to him, even in the midst of his darkest days, mm -hmm. right? Even in the midst of his failures, that God remained faithful to him. Aren't you glad that God doesn't give up That's on right. us mm -hmm. on our darkest days? Right? In our times of struggle, in our times of despair, right? Aren't you glad that he comes after us when we begin to wander off, we begin to stray away like that sheep that just kind of wanders off? So Jesus spoke a parable about this in his pursuing love in, in Luke's gospel. In Luke 15, verses 4 through 7, it says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. When he is found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he, come, when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. I believe if we're honest with ourselves tonight, we're a lot more like sheep than we care to admit. That's right. We're a lot more like sheep than we care to admit. That that's what we can be thankful for, the promises of God, right? Mm -hmm. The promises of God and His Word. The first truth that I want to testify about my shepherd is that I have my shepherd's provision. I have my shepherd's provision. Verses 1 through 3 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. From what I understand, uh, sheep are skittish and nervous animals. Mm -hmm. They tend to be nervous. They, they, they won't lie down or rest if they, if they are, are, are fear uh, or, or have fear of being attacked by predators. Also, unlike goats uh, that will eat anything, sheep prefer green grass, right? I, I guess that's, that, again, I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm going to have to base this off of my study, but that's what I'm told. They prefer green grass. Uh, sheep will not digest their food properly if they do not lie down and rest. Mm -hmm. That's another process. And, and, and Stacy's over here agreeing. He must be familiar with. We've got a couple of sheep experts, apparently, <laughs> uh, that know about these, uh, these animals. Uh, if they don't eat right uh, and get the rest they need, their, their wool not, will not grow. Uh, I guess it can be spotty or unhealthy or, or kind of uh, some type of a sheep type of a mange <laughs> type thing going on. Um, also, um, a little known fact, sheep make lousy swimmers. Uh, and, right, and I guess it makes sense because the, the wool would soak up the water and kind of... <laughs> Kind of make it hard hard for them to swim and kind of weigh them down and so they would uh what i what i saw was that they'll fill up with like a sponge and they'd flip upside down mm -hmm. <laughs> and feed me sticking up so anyway let's not try that let's not try any experiments and see if, it, if that's true or not um we're also told that sheep are afraid of moving water that's what makes them nervous and so uh sometimes shepherds would have to in the open prairie, they'd find a creek or a body of water. If it's moving water, they would make a little dam or a pond where they can drink from, because otherwise they wouldn't. They'd be afraid. And so I think that's kind of what we're looking at here about the, the still waters and what David's talking about. Uh, David make it, made it perfectly clear that, uh, or, or Jesus made it perfectly clear, rather, that his disciples were uh, completely dependent upon him for all things, for everything. Think about it this way. Every... Every process that's required to keep you alive comes from Jesus. Mm -hmm. All day long. Every, every process that must happen to keep you alive all day long comes from Him. It's completely dependent upon Jesus. You see, it's when we begin to think that we're the ones who are in control and we're the ones who are responsible for, for our lives and, and maintaining everything around us, that get, that's where we get in trouble, right? Mm -hmm. That's when we begin to, to get ourselves in trouble. That Jesus used the imagery of a vine and its branches to portray our need for him. Again, in John, John 15, verses 4 and 5, he says, Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. 
He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Nothing. Everything that the Lord wants us to have, guess what? He will provide. That's right. If he wants us to have it, he will provide it for us. Everything that he calls us to do, he will also provide us the means to do those things. Because sometimes that's the that's the barrier, right, for us being obedient. That he called us to do something and we're just kind of like, I don't see it. Right? I just I, I just can't. I mean, that, that was my struggle when he called me to ministry, when he called me to, to leave what I was doing and I just I just didn't you know, I just couldn't see it because I would I was seeing it from my perspective and not from his. Right. I didn't trust him. I you know he, he he told me what to do and I was like well I don't quite see that maybe I'm not hearing you right. Uh, but he made a way for he in his grace he helped me to understand mm. right in the form of stage three melanoma cancer he helped me to see uh, what he wanted me to do and he provided a way for this to happen. Sometimes God will make us wait longer than what than we would like. Amen. That's right. That, that we would have to wait longer than, than than we would care to, but he is always faithful to provide what we need to accomplish his purposes for us. I know that every situation in my that I find myself in, whether it's good or bad, my shepherd will always, always, always provide what I need. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing for you if you're one of his sheep. Whether it's comfort, he'll provide it. Wisdom, he'll provide it. Healing, he'll provide it. Discernment, encouragement, peace, strength. And even sometimes the right words to speak. We've talked about that quite a bit today in Sunday school and, and discipleship time. That, that as we study God's word and we hide God's word in our heart, that, that he will give us the recall of what to say in any given situation. That he is always providing for our needs. That he has promised to provide us food, clothing, and shelter. Just the necessities of life we See this in Matthew 6, right? Matthew 6 tells us this. He has also promised to provide us grace when we sin against him and against others. And Romans 5.20 tells us that where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. That's really good news. That's really good news. That means that there is no sin that is bigger than God's grace. There's no sin that's bigger than God's grace. And some of us have tried to out -sin God's grace. Amen? Some of us have had, and, and thank goodness we failed because it's not possible. And we also, it's sometimes we, we, we begin to backtrack, and it seems like we're trying to test him again. We're still trying out that theory. But you see, what I think what I want you to know as well tonight is if you're a believer, Jesus is your shepherd too. That's right. He's not just my shepherd. He's your shepherd too. These six verses are filled with personal pronouns, all right, beginning with my shepherd. Right? He's, not, he's not just my shepherd, he's your shepherd. This means that Jesus cares about and for you in a very personal way. He sees and he knows the, the needs that you have. And as your shepherd, he always is faithful to provide for all those needs. And as I like to remind us so often, not only does he provide for all our needs, he also provides for a whole lot of our wants. Miss mm -hmm. right? Bonnie was so, so quick to, to offer that all the time that she would always mention that because it's true. He doesn't just provide the, the, the basics or the necessities. He's also a gracious God. He gives us a whole lot of the things that we want as well. Of course, our greatest need was for us to be restored back to a right relationship with God. And Jesus met that need on the cross. He met that need on the cross. And through repentance of sin and faith in him, our sins are forgiven. And we are completely restored to a right relationship with God. And you say, well, sometimes I don't, I don't feel... Like I'm in a right, right relationship with God. It does, it's not about what you feel. That's right. It's not about what I feel. It, it, it's, it's, it's about faith. It's about what God's word says. If you have repented of your sins, if you have placed your faith in Jesus, you have been filled with the Spirit, then you have been reconciled with God, regardless of how you feel. That's right. Amen. Right? Just keep having faith until your faith catches up, your feelings catch up with your faith. We place our faith in Christ instantly. We are justified before God as, and we are seen as though we are sinless, that we have Christ's righteousness imputed to us. The Spirit of God dwells within us and leads us into the paths of righteousness. How, how do we live a righteous life? How, how can we live a holy life? How can we grow in righteousness and holiness and all those things? The Spirit of God does that for us. He works in us. The presence of the Spirit in a believer's life is the evidence of Salvation. 
The Spirit is the one that's shaping us and transforming us from the inside out to become more and more like Jesus. And so, so why is this all so important? Right? David even understood that, that all these things are vital and they're so important. And the answer for us is found at the end of verse 3. Why does it matter if we grow? Why does it matter that we're faithful? Why does it matter that we, we, we represent Christ well and, and live out our faith and, and depend upon Him for everything? For Him. For His name's sake. That's right. For his name's sake, our, our lives, everything about our lives are to point to him. Everything about our lives are to bring honor and glory to him. That's right. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about him. It's always for his name's sake. Saving sinners, bringing what was dead back to life, making something ugly beautiful, turning an enemy into a friend, restoring the fallen and forgiving the unforgivable, all brings glory to God. Mm-hmm. It's all for his name's sake. I have my shepherd's provision. If you're a believer, you have his provision too. That's truth number one. The second truth that we see tonight that I want to testify about is I have my shepherd's protection. Verses four and five. It says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Death is a certainty for all of us. That's right. Especially living in this fallen world that we do. Uh, We've all sinned, and the penalty of that sin is death. That's what the Bible tells us, right? Both physical death and eternal death. Spiritual death if we don't believe in Jesus. And I'm not being negative again. That's what the Bible tells us, right? Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, I'm not minimizing death. Death can be scary. Right? And I, I think as believers, I, I don't know that, I would say that we don't fear death for the sake of death. That it's the process of dying, maybe, right. that brings the, 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 the fear or makes us anxious. But death should not be something that, that, needs to, that we need to be fearful of as believers. Right? Every one of us is, are, are, are at some stage of dying right now. Did you know that? That's right. Even the most healthiest among us, we're all in some stage of dying right now. We begin the process of death at the very moment we take our first breath. That we're all born with an expiration date that only God knows. Mm-hmm. All of us, every single one of us. I believe in context, David is picturing a shepherd taking his flock through a valley where predators can easily hide. All around Jerusalem, there, there were these hillsides and, and just rocky crags for predators and, and, and bandits and all that they can hide there. And you, you think about uh, the shepherd bringing this flock through these valleys. There's nowhere for the sheep to go to be able to escape if they're attacked. The only thing standing between life and death for the sheep is their shepherd. That's, right. That's it. That, that, that he is the one that will protect them. And the shepherd uses... Uh, two work, uh, two tools basically to work with the sheep. The rod uh, was basically a short, uh, head, heavy club, uh, kind of like a, a, a nightstick, I guess, or you know, just uh, just a heavy uh, stick uh, used to, to smash the skulls of any predators that would attack uh, the sheep. Uh, and then the staff is a, a long pole with a hook on the end uh, to help to, to to pull or to guide the, the sheep. Uh, back in the right direction and sometimes they'll use uh, that, that pole to lift them out of a hole and so uh, I don't have a, a video of that but I do have a, a clip of something similar whenever a, a, it's not a shepherd it's a shepherd boy but you, you'll get the point you'll, you'll get the, the imagery I want you to see here watch, watch this clip See, we laugh at that, but 
is it? That's us. That's right. <laughs> that's us. That 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 is us. That 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 our shepherd is always. We're always messing up. We're always sinning. We're always falling in holes. And he's restoring us. He's rescuing us. And what do we do? <laughs> we go a little ways and right back in the ditch again. That's right. Right? But he loves us and he's faithful to us. Right? Always. Over and over again. We keep on doing this and he keeps on rescuing us. The rod and the staff, they brought comfort and protection to the, the flock. The flock had no reason to fear when their shepherd was standing watch over them. As Christians, uh, we should live lives that are free of fear for the very same reason. We have no reason to fear, right? We have no reason. With Jesus as our shepherd, we have the most powerful being in the universe keeping constant watch over us. Right? The most powerful being in the universe keeping constant watch over us. And yes, we're aware that we have an enemy, we have an adversary uh, that seeks our harm and, and, and wants our destruction. We know this, the Bible makes that clear. But what maybe you don't understand is that, that the, the devil can only do what he's allowed to do. Mm -hmm. right? That he's kept on a leash, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, that, that he can't do anything to, to, to God's people unless God allows it to happen. The book of Job uh, kind of makes that clear for us. And so, if that's the case, the question, that, that the age-old question is, why does God allow sometimes uh, for, for Satan to have his way or, or for demons to be able to afflict his people? I think there's, a lot of, there's lots of reasons for this to happen. Sometimes it's to bring about repentance of ongoing sin. Sometimes he'll allow that to happen as, as discipline or as the chastisement that we talked about some this morning in the sermon. Uh, sometimes it's to teach us to trust God more, right? And, and nothing helps us to understand the faithfulness of God than to experience affliction, right? And so the enemy is really good at doing that. Uh, sometimes it's just to teach, uh, to teach Satan uh, about uh, uh, our love for God and how, uh, just like Job again, that, that, that the devil said the only reason that Job worships you and loves you is because you've been so good to him, that you've blessed him. I mean, look how good, look how, how awesome his life is. And so sometimes it's the same way. It's not even about us. It's a, it's a reminder that we're, that God uses us to teach our enemy a lesson about That's right. uh, his faithful to us and our, and our love for him. But we can always rest assured that whatever happens to us in our life, that, that God has a plan for it. everything. Nothing, nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted. It may not be pleasant, uh, it may be painful, and there may, may be heartache involved. And sometimes we may even be tempted to ask the question, why, right? Everybody in this room right, has dealt with situations that happen that we're just not sure, you know, what the cause of this. What, why has this happened? Or why is this being allowed to happen? And what I've tried to, to teach myself and what I've tried to remind you over the years is it's not always about why, it's what. It, right? What? What, what, are, what are you teaching me through this? Or... or or, or what would you have me learn from this situation? But we can't always understand. And that again, that's why we have to always remember Romans 8, 28. Mm -hmm. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. You see, if you haven't done it already, and you, you probably should have, I've, I've only quoted it about a zillion times since I've been here, highlight it in your Bible. Right, and just mark it where you can have access to it. Or better yet, memorize it. That's right. Memorize it, right? That's a good one, though, a really, really good one to, to, to hide away in your heart because you're going to need it a lot. And, you're gonna, and I believe you're going to need it a whole lot more in the coming days. Right. You're going you're gonna to really need it in the coming days as, as, as this world begins to, to head towards its end and, and, and the return of Christ gets closer and closer that we need to remember what this verse tells us. That we're, we're surrounded at all times by evil that wishes to do us harm. Did you know that? At all, at, and, I, and I don't mean just people. Right? Sometimes I know that some people don't want to go anywhere. They, you don't want to go to town and there's bad people there. Or you can't go shop here and it's dangerous to go there. Some people think everywhere is dangerous. Mm -hmm. And maybe to you it is. Maybe you're just one of those people that's just scared of everything. I don't know. But there is evil out there. We know that. The Bible makes that clear. 
And what we can see is only a tiny fraction of what is actually taking place around us. Did you know that? There's an there's a unseen world. There's an unseen realm. There's a, there's a spiritual realm that we cannot see. And there's constantly battle going on around us. That's all right. around us. If we, could, if we could see what was happening around us, we'd have a reason probably to be terrified. That's if right. we could see. If we could really see what's happening around us. There's spiritual warfare raging all around us all the time. But as a people of God, we are far more protected than we even realize. Mm -hmm. Never doubt that. Right? Mm -hmm. Never, never doubt that. In the book of St. Kings, we're, we're told of a time when Israel was surrounded and greatly outnumbered by the Syrians. And, and you have Elisha the prophet there, and he has a, his, his, uh, his a little understudy, his servant, and he saw this massive army around them, and he began to despair. He's like, we're done. We, there's no possible way that we're going to survive this one. And in the midst of his despair, Elisha asked God to let him see the multitudes of the protectors, the multitude of angels that covered the mountains in the spiritual realm. St. Kings 16, verse 15 and 17 says, And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And verse 16 says, So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Mm -hmm. right, nothing's changed. That's right. Nothing has changed for God's people. Nothing has changed. Those same horses and chariots of fire still serve as a personal protector's of God's people. They're still protecting the good shepherd's flock right now. It's, it's still happening. This very same thing. Just because you can't see them, that doesn't mean that our protectors aren't there. That's right. They're always there. Who knows how many times God has protected us from our enemy and we never even knew about it. Mm. We're even earlier this evening, Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee coming up here tonight, right? Something could have very, something terrible could have happened, but it didn't. That's right. That God intervened and God protected him, right? And so we thank God for, for, uh, for that tonight. Amen. I believe, in fact, if we could understand, we'd know that our cup is running over with our shepherd's protection. Amen. We are, we are so loved and so protected. That's right. Amen. I have my shepherd's protection. If you are a believer, you have his protection too. And the third and final truth that. I want to testify about my shepherd is that I have my shepherd's presence. As great as the first two are, I think th this one is probably the most special. I think this one is the, the, the greatest of all, in, in my personal opinion. In verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. Right? Focus on that. Forever. Eternal. Right? Eternal. Our sins had severed our relationship with God, that we no longer had access to God. But our great shepherd is merciful and gracious towards us. He tracked us down and welcomed us back into his flock. You see, for every believer, we will never be without the presence of God again. Right? For everyone, if you placed your faith in Christ, you will never be without the presence of God again. Right. The moment that we turn from our sins and place our faith in Jesus, the goodness and mercy of God not only falls on us, but we are filled with the very presence of God, never to leave us again. Right. And again, just to set things in context, see, David, David didn't fully understand this. Right? In the Old Testament, how God dealt with his people, and his spirit, was, it was different. Right? In the Old Testament, the spirit of God would rest on individuals for a period of time, but, but it was never permanent. Uh, we see that all throughout the Old Testament that God's Spirit dwelt upon someone and then God's Spirit removed it and left that individual once that time of, of service or, or whatever the need was. It was never permanent. But once Jesus satisfied God's wrath on the cross, the Holy Spirit now comes and resides inside of every believer permanently. That's right. Permanently. There's nothing that we can do uh, uh, to, to run God's Spirit off or, or that He would leave us alone. In the Old Testament, God only dwelt with his people in the tabernacle and in the temple, but now in the New Testament and now today, God dwells inside of his people. Mm -hmm. 
He dwells within us. His Spirit dwells within us. No more sacrifices to be made. No more pleading for God's presence. Though sometimes we still do that, right? We ask God you know, to, to be with us. God is with us. He's always with us. That's right. We always have His presence. That it's, it, if, we're, if we're not experiencing or, 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 or again feeling or that we are experiencing God's presence, it's, not, it's, it's on our end. That, that, that His presence is with us because God's Word tells us this. That we are promised that He will never leave us or forsake us. Hebrews 13, 5 makes that promise to us. It says, let your conduct be without covetous, covetousness. Be constant. Be content with such things as you have. For He Himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. I will never leave you. Never. Nothing that you can do to cause God's Spirit to leave us, His presence to leave us. We can face the troubles of this life because we know that our shepherd faces them with us. That His grace is sufficient for all that we experience in this life. The, the fullness of His glory awaits us in heaven. Do we understand that? The fullness of His glory awaits us in heaven. And Jesus encouraged His disciples about being with Him in heaven before His crucifixion. He was trying to encourage them before He left. Right? They had, had forsaken everything to follow him. And Jesus had been with them for three years now. Every, every day they were with him. And now he was about to go away. And he was preparing them before he was to depart. They would understand that they would no longer have his physical presence. And he knew what the impact that would have on them. Or, 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 or they didn't understand how that would work. They, they thought they were going to be left alone as, as orphans. But he said, that's not the case. That my presence be with you. My spirit will come. He assured them of the coming of the Holy Spirit. He also pointed to their eternity to be spent in His presence. In John 14, verses 1 through 3, another one of those very encouraging passages. He says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Amen. What a promise. That's right. Right, what a promise that we have in Christ. The greatest gift of our salvation is not that we escape hell. The greatest gift of our salvation is that we will get to enjoy the presence of Jesus both now and for all of eternity. Amen. For all of eternity. That's the greatest gift of our salvation. I have my shepherd's presence, and if you're a believer, you have his presence too. So tonight, as we close to my brothers and sisters in Christ, first, my, to my fellow sheep, if you will, what a precious gift to have the provision, protection, and presence of the good shepherd in our lives. Amen? To have all these wonderful things in our lives, that we deserve wrath because of our sin, but God chose to give us grace instead that our shepherd provides everything that we need in this life to accomplish his purposes. We, we, we lack nothing. We have all that we need to accomplish his purpose. Our shepherd protects us from the attacks of our enemy, the, 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 from the devil and his demons, the, the hidden realm. We have protection that we cannot even comprehend or see. We also have our shepherd's continual presence, that he has promised to never leave us or forsake us. To those who have not yet believed in Jesus, yet, and I like to always emphasize that yet because I believe that, that God is still saving people. Amen. I believe that, that God is still uh, bringing in sheep from other flocks, building his flock, building his church. There, there's some bad news I have to start with. Um, I've been talking about my shepherd and everyone in here that has trusted Christ. He's your shepherd. But if you haven't believed in Jesus, he's not your shepherd. That's right. All these things that I've talked about tonight don't belong to you. You don't have any of this. You don't have the assurance of his provision. You don't have the assurance of his protection. And you absolutely do not have the assurance of his presence. Mm. You don't have any of these. But here's the good news. You can. That's right. You can. You can tonight. My shepherd can become your shepherd tonight through repentance and faith in Christ. You can leave here with all these things. You can leave here with the assurance of his provision, the assurance of his protection, and best of all, you can leave here with the absolute assurance of His presence. Mm -hmm. That He will never leave you nor, nor forsake you either. 
but you must repent of your sins and place your faith in Christ before that. So my question for you is, are you willing and ready to join the flock of the Good Shepherd? Not only is he my shepherd, he wants to be your shepherd too. That's right. Amen? Amen? All right, let me pray for us and we'll have a time to respond. Father, we thank you again for this day that you've given us. And, and Father, I know that sometimes whenever we read through and and study and, and even preach or hear sermons from passages that we're so familiar with that we can check out, uh, that, that we disengage. And Father, I, I, I hope and I pray that that didn't happen tonight. Uh, that we're so encouraged by your word and there are some passages that just touch us in a, in a different way. And, and Psalm 23 is one of those passages, at least for me. And so Father, I, I pray that your word has been an encouragement uh, for your people tonight. And Father, we're so thankful that uh, through Christ that, that we have the assurance of provision, that, that you always provide for our needs and a whole lot of our wants. Mm -hmm. God, that we have the assurance of your protection, that nothing will befall us that you have not allowed to befall us. And Father, most of all, and what we're most grateful for is we have your presence. That, that in the Old Testament, as we read your word, that, that your, your presence would, would dwell uh, among your people and they'd have to meet with you and, and stand off at a distance and had to to go to the tabernacle or the temple but they could never experience your presence like we can that not only are you uh, uh, near us but you are within us mm -hmm. and so god we thank you for that we thank you for the gift of your presence and we look forward to uh, spending eternity with you and, and being in your presence and, and and seeing you face to face so, Father, I thank you for this reminder tonight in these troubling days that we're in the midst of. God, I pray for those that are here with us tonight, maybe those that are watching uh, online or, or maybe those that will listen to this later or watch this later. God, I pray that you would stir their hearts. God, that they would hear about this, this shepherd, this, this good shepherd. They'd hear about your son, Jesus, and that they would want to believe. They would want to experience the, his goodness and they would, would want to have the assurance of his provision and his protection and his presence, God. And so, Father, I pray that you would just do a work in all of our hearts and all of our minds tonight. And again, help us to respond to, to you tonight in a way that is beneficial to us and brings honor and glory to you. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.